welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the session of Beverage 2.0. Um, so, Beverage key sort of report is going to be part of what we're talking about here is the idea of landmark reports making big differences to the thinking and analysis of poverty and social policy. Um, in the sense that Beveridge talked about five giants being things you're trying to slay, these guys are going to be talking about five giants as people <coughs> who you're not trying to kill, <laughs> uh, who all have strong uh, LSE connections and so we're going to be talking, in the sense, talking about the five giants of LSE-based uh, poverty research and the taking of policy research into policy and practice and, and engagement processes. So each of our each of our uh, LSE current LSE staff will be discussing past LSE alumni uh, uh, who were the key figures and key report makers uh, around poverty in the 20th century. Uh, first up, you, Lucinda, yes? So Lucinda is going to be first. Each speaker is going to be uh, talking for about 15 minutes. Uh, we will then have uh, a, a hopefully around half an hour for questions and answers at the end of the, end of the session. Okay, thank you. Lucinda. Great. Many thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, please do keep me to time because I'm going to be talking about a big report. Um, I'm trying to do it in a very oh, short space of time. Okay, so uh, um, I'm going to be talking about Beatrice Webb's minority report on the poor laws, going back to 1989, <coughs> so going back a long time before um, Beveridge's report of 9422, but as we'll see, there were some very uh, clear connections. Um, and uh, so I'll be talking about how it kind of articulates with the Beveridge report, as well as thinking a bit about some of the content itself and why it was important and um, interesting. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start by thinking about what uh, Beveridge said himself. Uh, so he um, stated that the Beveridge report stemmed from what all of us had imbibed from the webs. And in many ways you can think about him thinking very directly about the minority report when making this statement, as I hope will become clear. And here you see not only Beatrice but her husband Sidney Webb uh, working, um, working very hard together as they did. Before I move on to the report, I want to give just a little bit of brief background uh, leading up to the Minority Report on Beatrice Webb. Uh, so she was born in 1858, and she um, knew and was influenced by uh, Herbert Spencer, who was a family friend, um, and influenced some of her thinking, I think, around, around sort of classification, which was a uh, very major interest of hers. Uh, she, she fell in love with the radical politician uh, Joseph, Joseph <coughs> Chamberlain, um, but he ended up marrying someone else, which is kind of good for the brand of the Webbs and probably very good for the LSC. <laughs> um, <laughs> She worked on uh, Charles Booth's major study, um, sort of monumental survey of London life and labour, um, as a researcher on that study. So she really cut her, her teeth as a researcher on working for that study. Uh, she wrote um, reports for it, and she also uh, worked um, sort of undercover as a trouser hand. So she did some direct... Uh, it, it seems for, cause of, for some, in some ways rather implausible that this very genteelly brought up uh, woman... Um, rather sensitive woman should be working undercover as a trouser hand, but she did this, and she she analysed uh, the role um, of um, role of supply and demand in that um, in that industry. Uh, she then got very interested in the cooperative movement, and she also went um, undercover again to uh, try and um, understand a bit more about how the cooperative movement was working in different parts of the UK. Um, and as part of this interest, she became involved with the Fabian movement, and it was through the Fabian the Fabian movement that she met Sidney Webb who um, propositioned her repeatedly until eventually she agreed to marry him. And this was the beginning of what she saw as their partnership. She saw it very much as a, as a working partnership uh, where they were going to analyse um, society and uh, make it better. And as part of that, uh, with uh, George Bernard Shaw and um, uh, Graham Wallace, um, she uh, founded the LSE in 1895. So this is a group of people who founded the LSE uh, with, a, with, a, with a grant that had been left to the Fabians. Um, she did a lot of other stuff, but uh, here I'm going to jump forward and focus on uh, when she, her appointment to the Commission on the Poor Laws of 1905. So the Poor Laws had been rethought in 1834 uh, with the, the Poor Law Report of 1834, and there had been some kind of uh, various uh, changes, including um, 
uh, an act in 1905 about um, unemployed workers, but it had been kind of quite incremental, and there was a sense that the poor law really wasn't working, and that he therefore needed this commission, uh, which met between 1905 and 1909. Um, and uh, in 1909, the report of the commission was published, and we're going to see other reports of other commissions um, in, in later talks in this uh, session, um, but uh, uh, rather than subscribe to the report, which she didn't agree with, uh, she um, and uh, uh, collaborate, collaborators um, came up with an alternative, the minority report, um, which you can see. Um, see. So this is the whole uh, combined report. It's also, there's a copy outside if you want to look at it. It's massive. Uh, the main report is uh, uh, 700 pages, and the minority report is another 500. Uh, you can see the separate report um, with various names, but hers there at the bottom. This is Sydney Webb. Um, and here you can see some of the sorts of uh, calculations and facts and figures that were going into it. It's, it's monumental. It's a, it's a piece of um, a, amazingly in-depth research. Um, and I also highlight in here... Uh, the, the initial, well, sort of the second page where it's announcing who's invited to be on the commission, um, and you can see that uh, there we have Beatrice, wife of Sydney Webb. <coughs> we also have Helen, wife of wife of Bernard Bosanquet, and we have Olivia Hill, spinster. Um, so these, but uh, it's also there because uh, uh, we'll also put that up because Helen. Um, Bosanquet and uh, Olivia Hill, um, she'd had contact with, um, in relation to the Charity Organisation Society, which took a very kind of individualised, charity-based approach to poverty, which she had already dis disagreed with um, in the, in the, um, by the, by the 18, 1890s and, uh, and felt that it wasn't the solution to poverty, which she saw much more in structural terms. And so she really didn't get on with their um, work on the minority, on, on the, on the on Poor Law Commission, and that was part of what was driving this construction of the majority report. So the majority report, um, it, uh, it went back to an understanding of the poor laws as really being about the able-bodied, um, the able-bodied working man who needed to be um, really uh, incentivised um, uh, uh, to work. Um, and, uh, and they saw a major role for charity, um, and they say, or saw, saw it as, as, as there being really very individualised solutions. Uh, she disagreed, really, with all these, um, these emphases. And that's why she worked on the minority report, which, uh, which had, uh, had rather different emphases. In particular, it stressed that actually 90% of those who were currently being covered by the poor laws were not the able-bodied uh, working, it's sort of potentially working, working poor. 90% of them were, were being covered by the poor law for other reasons, for poverty caused by other reasons than being out of work, um, unemployed or underemployed. Uh, so she had a number of major, the, the report had a number of major propositions. It was signed in many names, but I'm going to say it just as, uh, talk it just in terms of her report at the, for the purposes of this discussion. Uh, first of all, she wanted to get rid of mixed workhouses, which covered all these different categories of poor and basically lumped them together. She saw these as damaging morally, she saw these as uh, highly problematic and that it meant that um, uh, infants and um, uh, respectable widows and um, prostitutes and um, the what she called feeble-minded um, were all being cared for together um, and it uh, made it impossible to have very specialised approaches to them or support them in appropriate ways. So then the report goes after saying we really need to get rid of these mixed workhouses. Workhouses are also abhorred everywhere by the respectable poor. They're hated. They're hated so much that people in some cases die rather than go into them, and rather than use them. Uh, we, need, we, need a much more, we need a much better system, and we need a system that treats different groups separately. So this was her fundamental pitch, which was a, a very much opposed to the majority of majority report, which saw as there being a collective responsibility, is to break down to different areas. Let's get infants out of the workhouse. She uh, pointed out this sort of appalling magnitude of infant mortality in the workhouses, which amounted in the first year of life to kind of um, up to 390 out of every thousand. Um, uh, she thought that maternity workhouses didn't really operate well as maternity hospitals. Maternity hospitals needed to be run by local authorities, and we needed to, there needed to be an expansion of health visitors. Uh, she thought that children, school-aged children, should be covered by the Board of Education, so their needs should be met by the Board of Education. She pointed out how children uh, were already being fed by local ed ed education authorities because uh, 
poverty cover under the poor laws, destitution a cover was, was insufficient to actually maintain them, to feed them. So she said, well, let's make this much more systematic. Let's take them out of the poor law and let's cover them under boards of education. Um, and she suggested that uh, old people, th there's been an old pe age pensions act brought in 1908. She said, this, well, this, is, this should be what covers old people who were very much seen as kind of deserving poor um, and that it should be brought down maybe to 65, maybe even to 60 um, and to enable to, them to be supported. And then she said we should separate out the mentally infirm of all ages, uh, what she called the mentally infirm, and, and consider them to be responsibility for committees for the mentally defective. So she tried to break down these, these categories that were often lumped together. The aged and infirm, she said, no, we shouldn't think about the aged and infirm, we should think about the aged separately from the infirm and think about supporting them kind of in, a, in, a, in a dignified way and, in, and outside the poor laws, outside the workhouse. So that, that was all the groups that she considered the non-able-bodied, the 90%, and then she did pay some attention to the 10% of the able-bodied, who were very much the notional focus of the poor laws, but who were, who were, who were not, not the sort of numeric focus of the poor laws. Uh, so she first discussed this issue of um, women, uh, able-bodied women. Okay, how do you understand able-bodied women? And she said, well, most of the able-bodied women covered by laws are in fact mothers, so they should be treated as mothers. Uh, we don't want them to work because then they'll be neglecting their children. We want them to be, and we want their children to be living with them, and um, and them to fulfil their responsibilities. And so they should be treated as such and supported as such. If they're not mothers, then they can be treated in the same way as able-bodied men, but only under in, in, in that instance. So it's a very much a sort of a, 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 a but um, a sort of gendered understanding, but also one that recognises the realities of of, um, of 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 parenting and women's lives. And then uh, the report also has a made um, discussion of the different sorts of ways in which able-bodied um, may, may need support. So as well as chronic unemployment uh, she, and uh, chronic underemployment, uh, she also uh, highlighted temporary unemployment, and that these things need to be considered separately, but also the relationships between them, so the ways that uh, temporary unemployment can lead to chronic unemployment. Um, and, and this major issue of chronic underemployment which has this, I think is the, only, uh, is the only place where the language, language is very trenchant throughout, it's you know, very, very powerful language, very angry a lot of the time, um, but it only gets close to kind of the giant's language when talking about chronic underemployment, where it talks about the evil of chronic underemployment. And this is something which in relation to sort of dockers have been noted for a long time, but have been felt sort of impossible to resolve. So she said this is something which can only be solved at the national level. It needs a national multi-stranded solutions um, and I've listed some of them uh, there, what was considered. So part of it was reducing the supply of uh, cheap labour in the form of youth labour, um, uh, and also part of it was um, reducing the supply in terms of mother's labour, women's labour, which was necessarily always cheaper, um, uh, and uh, because that's the way the labour market worked. Um, and, um, and then part of it was about um, training and retraining, um, and part of it was about matching, so national kinds of labour exchanges. Um, and she also thought that for temporary unemployment, trade student unions had a major role to play in providing benefits for temporary periods out of work, but she wasn't proposing insurance. She wasn't proposing social insurance. And if we think about the name of Beveridge's report, Social Insurance and Allied Services, that was at the heart of his proposals. It was very much not at the heart of her proposals, or the minority report proposals. Um, and then she, the report also discussed the delivery um, and the structure and financing and actually very practically how this could work, how it could work by lots of different bodies supplying the different sorts of needs that were defined. And the importance of professional delivery, the importance of not depending on charitable people who might, not, might or might not um, deliver effectively, um, and the importance of, sort of bureaucratic principles of impartiality. And this was also important, she felt, because she had a very strong <coughs> emphasis on conditionality. She fully accepted the dominant distinction that was that applied then, applied in beverage, and applies again today between the notions of deserving and undeserving poor. Um, and she felt that you had to have a conditions attached to ensure um, ensure that the um, uh, the, the people met, met expectations, they met expectations in how they brought up their children, uh, they met expectations in how they looked for work um, and in uh, responding to training incentives and so on. And that this was best done by, profession, by professional sorts of services, including drawing on existing ones that she already recognised as doing a good job, like she's very praiseworth, praising of the, um, uh, of the health visitors. Um, 
Okay, so, so I think, I hope you've been able to see some of the ways in which this already links to the sorts of proposals that were in the Beveridge Report and why he might have seen Beveridge, who worked as a researcher on this report, minority report, I should have said, uh, among, uh, <laughs> among um, um, many other, many other uh, um, subsequent big names of sort of social welfare, um, he, and why he might have seen this as being really informative, forming, his, forming the Beveridge Report, this sort of work. You can see it in the concern for child welfare. You can see it in the focus of, on women as mothers, and that they shouldn't necessarily be confused with workers, but should be able to, uh, support, be, be, able to be supported to, to bring up their children, um, whether or not there was a, there was a husband present. But perhaps most of all, you can see it in this proposal for integrated but distinct system provision, both at local authority and national level, and systems of provision that were appropriate to the life course stage, uh, so proper maternity provision um, for, 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 for mothers and infants, for example, edu integrated education systems at local authority level, and what she proposed really was a national, national uh, na a state system of health. So she really proposed a national health service, state system but regionally delivered at appropriate level, which was necessary uh, to underpin um, uh, the, the, uh, the ways of addressing poverty. So in that sense, I think she's very, very clearly, as you can see the antecedents of um, the <coughs> beverage report and how he saw these five giants as needing to be integrated if you were really to address poverty. If you address want, you needed all the other things working as well. You can also find in Beveridge very clearly this distinct, ongoing distinction between the able-bodied and the non-able-bodied, the people who should be expected to, uh, to make efforts to work and the people who shouldn't make, make efforts to work. And this you can see very strongly in this report as well. But as I've mentioned, she doesn't support, she didn't support insurance. So while she can be seen, and this report can be seen as really very uh, re 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 um, laying the groundwork for the Beveridge report, it was ignored at the time, but you can see that it took uh, it only took thirty odd years for it then to be recognised in the um, in the Beveridge proposals and the subsequent uh, subsequent work on it. While Beveridge was very influenced by this and the subsequent welfare state was very influenced by some of these ideas, she didn't actually return the favour. So I just thought it would be nice to end on this quotation where she commented on the Beveridge report. <coughs> when it came out. Uh, so she, she thought it was uh, very unlikely, actually, that it would be implemented. But if carried out, which I think unlikely, it will increase the catastrophic mass unemployment, which could happen here as in the USA. The better you treat the unemployed in the way of means without service, the worse the evil becomes. Because it is better to do nothing than to work at low wages and conditions. So I think that just is a way of ending, giving us a slightly different take on, uh, on Beatrice Webb, the reformer and founder of the Thank you. Thank you. Going. Just keep yeah, going. Yeah, it's that way around. Yeah. No? Oh, I see. It goes on. Click it. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so um, first of all, welcome everybody um, to come here into a room with no windows on a sunny Saturday afternoon. <laughs> I'm extremely impressed. Um, so, um, Lucinda was just talking about one LSE giant. I get to talk about two. And I get to talk about this particular occasional paper in Social Administration, number 17. Um, and we were asked to sort of think about the effects of these landmark reports. So in contrast to the 1,200 pages that uh, Lucinda was just talking about, this is, um, in terms of the meat of it, 69, 69 pages. Now, those of you who are from universities, including the LSE, will know that we are dominated or have been dominated until approximately four months ago by something called the Research Excellence Framework, the REF. I'll come back to that. Actually, that's changed. Um, LSE has been dominated for the last few months by something called the TEF, uh, the Teaching Excellence Framework. Um, but I gather since the day before yesterday, uh, most British universities, although not LSE, are dominated by something called the PEF, the pension erosion framework. <laughs> um, but anyway, let me go back to the REF. Part of the REF is about our impact. Are we having an impact uh, from our research? And so that's the way I've approached um, thinking about what the effect of this particular small pamphlet um, was. Okay, that way, that way. Now, 
Writing an impact case study um, on, um, on the poor and the poorest would be a complete doddle. It is credited in a lot of places with the rediscovery of poverty um, in 1965. So between, I don't know, I can't quite work out between the Beatles' first LP and all of that, um, but, but round about the same thing. So for, for poverty to be rediscovered, it must have been lost. And there we can go back to one of the greatest influences on Beveridge himself in his report, Seabone Roundtree, and Seabone Roundtree's third report, carried out of, of poverty in York, um, carried out in 1950 with Commander Labours. Um, Seabone Roundtree was a little old at the time. And he found in that survey, he calculated from that survey, that 2.8% of York's population um, were in poverty, compared with, on, they argued, a comparable basis, 31% in 1936. So the post-war welfare state, hugely influenced by Beveridge's writing, particularly the, um, the, the five greater, the, the, the great assumptions, there were nothing to do with social insurance, the full employment of the National Health Service and child allowances, had abolished <coughs> poverty. And that was part of the great post-Second World War New Jerusalem optimism, that we had, we'd cracked these problems and people like Beveridge um, or responsible for it. Now, there has been reanalysis of Beveridge, uh, of Roundtree's own, uh, of Roundtree's own work, particularly by um, Timothy Hatton and uh, Roy Bailey. Um, that actually, if the, the analysis has been done properly, they should have been talking about 8.6 percent of York's population in poverty. Still, a lot lower than the, what they argued was the equivalent line. Now, this was something that um, many people in what was then the Department of Social Administration here, our own department, now the Department of Social Policy. Um, was um, uh, well, beginning to question this view, led by Richard Titmus, but also Brian Abel Smith um, and Peter Townsend, questioning whether this could be true. I and mean, when you saw things like Peter Townsend's The Family Life of Old, old, old People in the, in the 1950s, clearly there were people who, by um, any description of their conditions, you would have thought of as poor, rather than it just being 2.8% um, of them. Now, in a huge breakthrough, I think, although I'll be corrected um, by, by Stephen and others, they were given permission by the Ministry of Labour to analyse the records from the 1953 and 1960 family expenditure surveys, which had data for the whole country, not just for York, but for, um, for the entire country. The previous studies have really focused on, on, on town by town, city by city, all the way back to... Um, to, to Charles Booth in the, uh, in the 1890s. Um, and they argued that instead of a, what they argued was an out-of-date subsistence um, standard going back to the mid-1930s, they would use the official minimum. What the, the country, through its government, had said should be the national minimum. In those days, national assistance, it became supplementary benefit, later became um, income support. Um, and they argued that officially it had been said that nobody should be built below that level. They went further than that and said that actually if you looked at all the little extras you could get on top of national, national assistance, like you were allowed to earn a bit of money, you could get extra allowances for spe specific needs and for exceptional um, uh, periodic expenses, really the level ought to be 140% of that. And they, so they, they looked at how many people were living um, with um, a, a level of living below that 140% of the national assistance scale. Um, <clears throat> now, they found that actually in 1953, when they could only look at spending, uh, no income um, collected in the 1953 <coughs> survey, um, only 1.2% had level actually below the minimum the state was supposed to, to guarantee, but 4% had income below 140%. What they argued was a, a better notion of the, of the state minimum. Um, and they also argued that if the original, uh, that, that the taking the line used by Roundtree and Labour's, that, that it would have been 4%. So in some way, they weren't um, entirely um, criticizing, um, criticizing what Roundtree and Labour's had found. But, and this was in some ways the devastating bit, they found that by 1960, when you could look at incomes, that 4% of the population had incomes below national assistance levels, and nearly 8% were below the 140% line. 
In other words, seven and a half million people. Um, or more to the point, two and a quarter million children. And it was that kind of statistical demonstration, if you like, of the extent of the size of, a program, of the problem that in the first part of 1965 um, caused a group of people to, um, to, um, to, to start convening. Um, a group of people who eventually um, formed themselves <coughs> with Brian Abel Smith and Peter Townsend into the Child Poverty Action Group, which is still here today. And they then took their research, which they've been talking about clearly in seminars, um, and turned it into this occasional paper, um, price 15 shillings, um, um, and launched it strategically on the 22nd of December 1965. The formation of CPAG was announced on the 23rd of December, so that the papers of Christmas Eve were full of the two and a quarter million children living in poverty um, in Britain today, combined with some TV coverage of the living conditions of some of those children. Um, so to quote um, Alan Watkins, uh, writing in The Spectator a year and a quarter later, child poverty, which until a few months ago was hardly talked about outside the claustrophobic confines of the <laughs> London School of Economics, I speak about the school's physical characteristics, is now a political issue. Now, um, it seems to me that case made in my impact case study um, from its report. And you can see the effects of that running from the family allowance increases um, uh, of the late 1960s um, all the way through to um, Gordon Brown's introduction of the child tax credits um, in the 2000s by way of other things. And indeed the falls in child poverty defined in modern ways in the 2000s. Now, now there we are. This is a piece of research. Um, it had an impact. Um, but a department like ours is expected to produce four or five impact case studies. <laughs> they did more than that. It had a huge effect on um, academic understanding. Now, whether this will be allowable as, as, as impact in the next ref is not totally clear, but it's wider than it used to be. Um, but as, you know, within the 1950s, Brian Abel Smith was already writing about belief in a subsistence minimum is a belief in ever-increasing inequality and, a, and class distinction. And that, that was why they took the idea of this official um, or um, social security line. But Peter Townsend went on to build on that um, using the specific national follow-up um, focused on poverty um, that was carried out in 1968, but eventually not published until 1979 um, as Poverty in the United Kingdom. He, part of that, and part of the debate around that, part of the academic debate around that was Peter Townsend's attempt to justify the 140% um, of supplementary benefit, as was then line. But really to, to go beyond this, to, to develop the idea of a participation standard. The idea that we should be looking at the items that were, if you like, customary in that society, in today's society, uh, that people were living in, and the items that people lacked um, because they couldn't afford them. And that then, there's a long stream of work that follows from that, including Joanna Mack and Stuart Lansley's um, Breadline Britain surveys for, for television in the 1980s, with a popular definition, a vote on what necessities were. And then on to the poverty and social exclusion surveys led from the Townsend Centre itself at Bristol University and its equivalents in other countries. Um, and they also, interestingly, I think, in many ways sparked off the idea of should we be looking at spending, as they'd looked at from the 53 survey, or income, as in the 1960 survey. And they don't really sort of talk about these things as being distinct, um, because they're not matching um, the two up together. They, they use, okay, they use um, uh, spending in one, uh, for one survey and income for the other. Okay, that's a second impact case study, if we allow <coughs> academic understanding. But there was a th clearly a third. Um, following this from, from the late 1960s, right up until the 1990s, the then Department for Social Security continued to publish a series called the Low Income Family St Statistics, using directly the 140% line for people who were living in, um, in poverty or on the margins of poverty, using that standard, which incidentally um, had reached 33% by 1992, where, after which they stopped publishing it. <laughs> Um, but, and here's a problem with the original 
should disappear from here. Okay. Um, with the, this idea of an official standard, it does have a problem, pointed out by Mrs. Thatcher's um, Secretary of State for Social Security at the time, John Moore, um, that if you make that official standard more generous, then more people will be caught by it. If, conversely, you make it less generous, then fewer people will be caught by it. Um, so that, that is a, a clear problem with that approach, and that's what led in the official statistics to the development of what we still have published today, the Households Below Average Income Statistics, which look at numbers below um, particular fractions, 60% most commonly, <coughs> of contemporary median income, um, or below lines that are actually fixed in real terms over time. And, and that, that carries out not just, um, from not just in the UK, but was being developed um, elsewhere in Europe and, in, and are used today by the European Commission, OECD and others. So, so you see the lines of development stemming from um, what they did and then improvements on it. But there's another, I think, very big breakthrough which is this whole idea of secondary analysis, the idea of, of taking things that were collected for one reason and using them for an entirely different purpose. The reason for the Family Expenditure Survey has nothing to do with uh, poverty statistics or income distribution. It's there to work out how you balance price increases in the price of baked beans and price increases in the prices of cars. How do you weight those to produce an overall single measure of the rate of inflation? That's what the FES is there for. And it was their um, insight, I don't know whether others had had this before, that you could take that data on what people were spending their money on and then later on augmented by what, what their incomes were um, to use that to get a national survey for the whole country of what income levels look like, not just people who pay taxes, um, which we otherwise have. And they persuaded the Ministry of Labour to let them do it. Yeah. Which, I mean, that in terms of getting secondary use of administrative data is something which um, people, um, a, 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 um, a huge legacy for those of us today. And that's what a lot of, um, that's what a lot of quantitative social science is about. It's about taking data that already exist and realizing that there's another purpose we can put it to. Sometimes the right questions have been asked, but, but we can turn it to those purposes. So, so that is what I saw as being, um, if our department has to produce four impact case studies for the next, for the next ref, um, this single small pamphlet <laughs> would have done it. But then I learned last weekend something I hadn't known, um, which will link to what Stephen is going to be saying later that in the 1960s there was a young economist uh, by the name of Tony Atkinson who read The Poor and the Poorest. And that led to Tony's 50 years of research in this area, starting with his um, original um, exploration of poverty and the reform of Social Security um, in, uh, in 1968. <coughs> um, and I think there are few bigger impacts than, that anybody could have had than to get Tony to devote his career to this area. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So Lucinda got to talk about one giant John got to talk about two giants. I get to talk about three giants. Um, Stiglitz, Sen, Matusi, and their commission on the measurement of economic performance and social progress. I don't think we can quite claim all three of these as LSE giants, uh, but Amartya Sen, world's professor of economics here um, in the uh, first part of the 1970s and also a centennial professor later in Stickard. Uh, so we have a, a strong and enduring connection with, with at least one of these uh, three giants. So the background to the report is that it was commissioned by President Sarkozy of France in 2008, uh, importantly before the uh, economic crisis had really unfolded, uh, with the aim of identifying the limits of GDP as an indicator of economic performance and social progress, and to consider additional information that might be required. So a fairly dry sounding and um, limited brief 
for this commission. One's reminded, perhaps, of the origins of the beverage report, also <coughs> intended to be simply a review of social insurance and allied uh, services, and um, originally a very limited brief, which, as everybody knows, Beveridge took and produced uh, his uh, world-changing uh, report with his five giants uh, and the blueprint for the welfare state. Similarly, I will show you that uh, Stiglitz, Sen and Fertusi took their brief and expanded it enormously into something that's had uh, reverberations across the world, not just in, in France. Um, but I think there is a difference uh, between the two in the sense that the wartime British government commissioning um, beverage uh, had no idea what they were letting themselves in for. Uh, whereas Sarkozy, having chosen these three to write the uh, report, to, to head the commission, must have known a little bit uh, what he was letting himself in for because uh, they all already had, had form in terms of expanding the range of the sorts of information uh, that are considered relevant for assessing social progress. But like Beveridge, uh, that uh, expansion was about thinking about other domains and other dimensions beyond the narrowly material or narrowly economic. Uh, and this expansion was a key legacy of what the uh, Commission produced. I mentioned that the report was commissioned before the crisis, but by the time they reported in 2009, the world had, had changed. A financial crash and the ensuing economic crisis had begun to unfold. And in the report, uh, they comment, the whole commission is convinced that the crisis is teaching us a very important lesson that those attempting to guide the economy and our societies are like pilots trying to steer a course without a reliable compass. So a strong claim for the way in which indicators, measurements, what we think we're trying to gauge in an economy and a society is part of what shapes how policymakers respond and understand the world around them. And they go on, the time has come to make a clear move from measuring production to measuring welfare to try to close the gap between our measures of economic performance and widespread perceptions of well-being. So a second point there, that there has to be a tie-up between what is officially measured, what people perceive to be poverty, hardship, their subjective experience, and what official statistics are producing and guided by. And that perhaps relates back to something that John was saying about the uh, work of Townsend and Brian Abel Smith, uh, that the view that poverty had been abolished no longer corresponded to people's uh, experience of and what they saw going on around them. So some of the key insights and recommendations from the um, Sen Stieglitz Petusi Commission. Well their first point was that measuring the performance of the market economy contains only limited information about poverty, let alone broader well-being. So standard measures of GDP, GDP growth, GDP per capita, uh, insufficient to guide an understanding of what was happening to those who were disadvantaged. And that, of course, had already been recognised internationally in international development. So SEN had been one of the key influences in <coughs> developing the Human Development Index, which moved away from thinking about international <coughs> development purely in terms of <coughs> GDP growth towards... Uh, thinking about the dimensions of health, including life expectancy and uh, educational uh, achievement alongside uh, GDP per capita to try and expand the informational base on which international development was shaped. So the same point essentially being made here about national indicators. Further, they argued that incomplete metrics led to mistaken inferences about good and bad policies. And in the Commission's report, they give a couple of examples of that, uh, the most obvious perhaps being about uh, climate sustainability and the failure of governments, including, of course, the French government, to guide economic policy by uh, concerns taking into account the impact on the climate. Because uh, environmental goods are not included within a measure of GDP, a standard measure of GDP, uh, it doesn't feature... Uh, uh, unless specific provision is made in guiding uh, economic policy. 
But another example they give is very pertinent, of course, to the uh, causes of the economic crisis, uh, that because of the way that um, debt doesn't feature uh, differently from other forms of um, spending, so in other words, spending that's fueled by debt, by borrowing rather than uh, by production, uh, is also, uh, can also lead to bad policies in their analysis. So the fact that economic growth was being fueled by debt uh, didn't show up sufficiently clearly in the thinking uh, of those managing the economy prior to the economic crisis. So they make five recommendations about improving measures of national and household income. Uh, so staying within that broad envelope of measuring economic resources, but arguing that those measures should be adjusted to take account of non-market production. So that would include things like um, unpaid work in the home, such as childcare. That it should be expanded to take account of wealth and debt, expanded to take account of leisure, and placing a value on leisure rather than just treating it as a residual, and sensitive to inequality, so that it matters where the gains are being accrued uh, and where the losses are being felt. Then they made five recommendations about measuring quality of life, so making the argument that national and household income was crucial, but we also need to think about broader measures of quality of life. And this, for those of you who know uh, the capability approach, speaks directly uh, from that stable. The quality of life should be measured directly in terms of the beings and doings that people value and have reason to value. So multidimensional and focusing directly on what people are doing, for example in terms of health and education, rather than looking at the inputs or resources uh, by themselves. Also argued that subjective well-being should be part of that measurement uh, alongside more objective measures of well-being. That one should maintain a dashboard of indicators and not attempt to aggregate everything into a single index of quality of life. That it was important to analyse the links across those dimensions and the links between those dimensions and the resources that people have at their disposal. And to analyse inequalities in their uh, distribution. Furthermore, the Commission uh, made two recommendations about measuring sustainability. And interestingly, they treat sustainability as being both about economic sustainability and about environmental sustainability. And the key point that they make in the report is that this needs to be based on measures of stocks and measures of flows, and that the stock element has been largely missing um, from previous uh, metrics. Interestingly, for those um, who have followed some of the debates within the capability approach between uh, Marcia Sen and Martin Nussbaum, the Commission's report, of which Sen is one of the three authors, contains a list of capabilities. So this has been a key bone of contention uh, between Sen and Nussbaum, and Sen is frequently criticised for not having uh, produced a list of which capabilities should form the focus of evaluation, in contrast to Nussbaum's uh, prescribed 10-point list of capabilities, which she argues are universal across place and time. Uh, Sen's always been extremely reluctant to endorse a list, but here is a list with <laughs> Sen's name, and it says, <laughs> material living standards, health, education, personal activities including work, so that's both paid and unpaid work essentially, uh, political voice and governance, social connections and relationships, environment, present and future conditions, uh, and insecurity, both economic insecurity uh, and physical insecurity, so the extent to which you might be exposed to violence or harm. So this is a very striking list, I think, uh, and it's striking that it's a list that has Sen's name attached to it. It's important uh, because um, I think it uh, has echoes of um, the beverage report, certainly, um, and many other um, efforts to understand uh, well-being uh, across dimensions. So linking it back to our five giants, material living standards clearly has a great deal to do with the giant of want. Health has a great deal to do with the giant of disease, education with ignorance, personal activities including work 
a clear connection with idleness and environment, which includes things like uh, housing in, in the uh, Commission's report, uh, relates clearly to squalor. So um, one could perhaps, without too big a stretch, um, put Beveridge as one of the um, first advocates of a capability approach. <laughs> the, um, it's interesting also to think about the dimensions that were not captured in, in uh, those five, five giants and that the Commission really uh, brings out. And several of these have to do with that dynamic perspective. So not just thinking about a snapshot at a particular point in time, but thinking about well-being as something that has a dynamic. Um, so thinking of including measures of wealth, not just including measures of income, is clearly about understanding the longer term. Similarly, thinking about insecurity. It's about how things fluctuate over time. It's not good enough to simply have enough income or enough food to eat today. It's about thinking about how that fluctuates over time. Uh, but also elements that are more to do with the social aspect of well-being, which didn't really feature clearly uh, in Beveridge's report, to do with political voice and governance, to do with social connections and relationships. And interestingly, the social connections and relationships um, was one of the missing giants put forward uh, during the festival um, for you to vote on, the, the loneliness giant that we had. Uh, and, of course, the winning missing giant from the competition was the one on environmental sustainability. So, um, sends um, uh, the, the Commission's uh, list of, of eight uh, dimensions of well-being incorporated uh, the missing giants, if you like, as well as uh, those that we um, are familiar with from, from Beveridge. So, the Commission's thinking, I think, had an important set of important implications for thinking about, uh, thinking about want. First of all, the argument was clearly made that lack of resources, lack of material resources, is not an adequate proxy for understanding want. That's a number of, for a number of reasons. Firstly, because resources are incompletely captured by most of our standard metrics, so thinking about income, for example, it's important, but it's not enough to capture the full set of resources that matter to people in avoiding want. Secondly, because those resources are, cap are converted uh, at different rates into well-being by people in different circumstances. That has to do with differential needs. So large families need more resources than smaller families in order to achieve um, the same um, standard of living, something that recent reforms to um, child benefits seems to fail to acknowledge. Um, but also people in other circumstances, for example, uh, living in a colder region, living in a west, less well-insulated house, uh, may need more resources in, to, in order to achieve um, the same kinds of outcomes in terms of their beings and doings. And thirdly, lack of resources is not sufficient because um, in some cases, for example, if we're thinking about social connectedness, it may not be the sole or even the most important determinant of that outcome. Hence the argument that we should be aiming towards measuring these uh, deprivations directly rather than through the proxy of lack of resources. And this pushes our thinking towards broadening the scope of the relevant inputs that we're thinking about, so not just um, material resources, but also thinking about social and political resources uh, that people may be able to draw on. It broadens the scope of the relevant outcomes in the way that I've just described with those eight aspects of quality of life, and it broadens the scope of the potential interventions that are relevant uh, in order to address what. And I think it's this, this broadening out in those three respects that is fundamental to um, what the Commission contributed. There's some evidence of impact of the Commission. Um, the, uh, immediately um, uh, following the Commission's report, it was taken up uh, across the rest of the EU. Um, arguing for uh, changes to the way, way that uh, we thought about development, so GDP and beyond. Um, in the UK, um, David Cameron uh, initiated a measuring national well-being programme that is still uh, pursued with annual reports by the Office for National Statistics that took up a large range of these uh, quality of life measures. 
The OECD's Better Life Initiative later morphed into the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic <coughs> performance and social progress, very directly drawing on the work of the Commission, and also um, at uh, the level of the UN, talking about incorporating a richer array of measures, including multiple dimensions and subjective <coughs> well-being. So an impact that stretched well beyond the original Sarkozy Commission. But I think there are also a number of challenges, and this is what I'll finish with, um, to thinking in this, in this way, and particularly thinking in this way about um, the giant of, of want. First of all, I think there is an uneasy relationship in the Commission's report with subjective well-being. So it's there alongside objective well-being, but it's never quite clear whether it's just another aspect of quality of life that might sit alongside um, measures of health and measures of education as just another thing that we might be aiming for, or whether the idea is that all of these things contribute to subjective well-being, contribute to some sort of underlying latent life satisfaction, um, which is the ultimate uh, goal of all of these different types of, of measures. <coughs> and I suspect that may reflect a disagreement amongst Sen, uh, Stiglitz and Fatusi on this, on this point. My own view is that it matters very much to measure subjective well-being, but that it is never sufficient as a wrapping up of the other measures. It's never a sufficient aggregate um, uh, re or replacement for the measures of individual um, elements of objective well-being. And one example of that, uh, why that's important, is that in the uh, recent recession, uh, it barely registered in terms of changes in life satisfaction. Uh, whereas we know that, for example, uh, the rate of suicides went up considerably. So it seems to me that it's never sufficient to, to rely on subjective well-being uh, in assessing social progress. The second challenge for this approach, I think, is the potential loss of focus on income poverty. So great, we've broadened out the informational space, we're considering all sorts of components of people's lives that perhaps have previously been ignored, but does that allow policymakers, does that allow analysts to lose focus on the critical question of income poverty? Does it all become a bit too uh, diffuse and easy to lose um, some central questions? Then the approach of um, retaining a dashboard of indicators, having lots of different things to measure rather than trying to add them up into a single index, very rich in terms of the range of information that one uh, obtains but making it extremely difficult for policymakers to understand how the different options available to them might uh, impact on an overall measure of social progress. Difficult to assess trade-offs between different dimensions without some form of, of aggregation or index. And finally, um, does measuring things better actually lead to change? The Commission clearly thought that it did. They make that argument in their uh, introduction. I'd very much like to think that it did, since I've spent most of my academic career trying to measure things better. Uh, but actually, hard evidence of the way in which these kinds of shifts in thinking about what we should measure and how we measure it have led to real change on the ground are a little bit more difficult to, to come by. Thank you very much. <coughs> on the left hand side we have a landmark study on the right hand side we have an LSE giant and his name is Tony Atkinson it's not monitoring global poverty um, Tony, yes, Tony was actually on the uh, member of the Stiglitz Team of the Tusi Commission amongst other things about what we've just heard and he's an LSE giant because he was a Tuk professor here for at least 12 years before he went off to Cambridge and Oxford, but we got him back again as a centennial professor between 2010 and 2017 uh, when he unfortunately died. Um, so thinking about these two things, what brings them together? What I'm going to talk about is primarily focus on why monitoring global poverty represents a change in thinking about the prevalence of want, which is, what, I guess, why we're, we're all here today, and, and John called this impact, so this is the impact case study, if you will, for this report. And then, towards the end, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how this relates back to beverage, 
uh, and the other reports and the other authors that we've heard about this afternoon, and also relate it a bit to um, Tony's uh, trajectory. But if you want to think about uh, why the, the monitoring global poverty is a landmark study, uh, first you will have to note that the, in the little words down the bottom here it says World Bank Group. So this is working for the World Bank, and of course I'm going to explain how they have an immense uh, influence over our understanding of what constitutes global poverty. And uh, so to basically understand the impact of this report, you have to understand what the World Bank does and has been doing since the early 90s. Um, so essentially there are three components to this work. You can think of when they think about how many poor people there are in the world and how many of the numbers have been changing. First of all, you need some definitions, of course. <coughs> and then you need some data of the kind that uh, John was explaining uh, comes about using surveys. And then, of course, that gets your estimates. So here it is. This is what the World Bank does. Regardless of whether or not you agree or not, and we'll come back to that maybe, this is what they do. So first of all, it's understood that how well off people are is summarized in terms of basically how much money they have coming in, either coming in or going out in terms of spending. So I'll, I'll refer to income for short. So household living standards, it's summarized in a monetary measure. And the assumption is you can do that. Then, of course, to assess whether or not somebody is poor, or sometimes referred to as extreme poverty, you need a, a cutoff. So you count how much money people have got, and if they're below that cutoff, then they're counted as poor. Where do you draw the line? And how do you draw the line, this so-called global poverty line? Well, the World Bank has always used what is known as a fixed or absolute approach to doing this. So the idea is that it's the same level, regardless of what country you're talking about, and for every year that you're doing the comparisons. So the global poverty line is the same in India, it's the same, same line in Chad, same in China, Kazakhstan, and so on. Also the US, US, for that matter, but in effect the line is basically so low that rich countries are never counted as having anybody that's poor, um, according to this methodology. Same for years. It's the same line whether or not it's 1981, 1991, or 2001, or 2017 for that matter. Then the World Bank has access to a large number of surveys from all around the world. You know how many countries there are in the world? Well, it, it's disputed, of course, <laughs> but uh, think near a number of, of 200. And of course, you're doing this for multiple years. So that's a big ask in terms of information uh, required. And that gives you some estimates. But this is what they do, and hugely influential. Um, They've been doing this since the 1990 World Development Report. Most of you have probably heard of the Millennium Development Goals and the, the later Sustainable Development Goals. Millennium Development Goals, uh, which were set a large number of targets to be achieved by 2015. Number one, goal one, was eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. So there are, there are many, many targets. But in fact, the way in which the, the target was specified was in World Bank language, using the monetary poverty line that I'll talk a bit more detail in a minute. The Sustainable De Development Goals um, expanded from 8 to 17, but number one, you can see it, no poverty. But how is poverty measured? Still measured in a World Bank way. So really important, uh, regardless of whether or not you agree with the approach, this is what they do. But of course, it, it, there has been a lot of controversy about how to set the line. And the second th thing that's particularly a lot of controversy about is the so-called PPPs, or Purchasing Power Parities. And you go, what the heck's that? Well, the answer is they're special exchange rates. Uh, well, you want, as I said, you have to have the same line in Chad, in China, <coughs> Colombia, and so on. So how do you, you do it? Well, you think you might convert across countries using the market exchange rate. Well, that's no good because it leaves out a lot of non-traded goods that are particularly important, services and so on, that are particularly important in many countries around the world. So think of uh, PPPs as uh, economics and statisticians, fancy exchange rates. But of course, there's a lot of controversy. I mean, you're comparing living standards and baskets of goods and services that differ hugely around the world. Um, so, but I'll, I'll come back to why that, that's particularly important. But there's a whole way in which sensitivity can enter into these sorts of things. So what changing the way in which you 
uh, drive the global poverty line, ch changes to how the PPPs are set, and of course changes to data quality more generally are going to affect what's going on and whether or not people think the estimates are credible. So just to illustrate the bit about um, purchasing power parities, um, in the, the, there's been three or four main uh, estimates of uh, sets of purchasing power parity. It takes years to derive these. You have to get prices from all around the world on hundreds and thousands of, of goods. Well, in uh, 2011, when they, sorry, in 2014, when they re released the 2011 PPPs to replace the earlier 2005 ones, there was this Center for De Global Development in the U.S that put out a thing on its blog saying, as you can see, the headline, global absolute poverty, and that IE is measured in the World Bank way, fell by almost a half on Tuesday. <laughs> okay, so ch change the exchange rates in which you do this, and it can have an amazingly big effect. But, you know, this is the whole size of that. You know, it, it's not credible. And uh, I can give you a link also to the World, Bank, World Bank's reaction to that, which was... Um, apoplectic <laughs> from the main measure. OK, what are the lines? OK, I put up on this slide the three lines um, that, that currently exist at the moment. I'll just, and and the, associated with each of those lines has come uh, major sets of estimates from, from the World Bank. But I, I'm going to point you to the lines because they're the ones you've probably heard of. They're ones that are in the Millennium Development Goals and so on. So at the top is the dollar a day line. In fact, it wasn't a dollar a day, it was a dollar eight. Um, but, but why does it say a dollar? Answer is everything is converted into so called international dollars. That's PPPs. And that's why it says at the end there, at 1993 PPPs, purchasing power parities. That's what's in the Millennium Development Goal, a target against this dollar a day thing. But how is that line derived? The answer was it's the take. The poorest countries in the world, in fact, the World Bank Group took 22, uh, those national poverty lines, convert them into the international dollars, so they're comparable with each other, and then take the average of those. Very intuitive idea. These are you know, countries that are really, really badly off. They have some idea nationally about what counts as extreme poverty. We'll take the average of those. And that leads effectively to that line. What do they do next? The next main study, also associated with the, um, uh, the, the new PPPs, uh, came out m through the middle of the 90s. And, uh, and, and later, we ended up with the $1.25 uh, a day line at 2005 PPPs. And this is the line referred to in the, strate uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but importantly, there were changes in terms of the number of countries that were covered and uh, the quality of the data. But another thing that they did was that they changed the countries for which they took the average of their national poverty lines, the, the 15 countries. And this was a, a big source of controversy. Let me talk you through it, for example. So what happened was that in the earlier study uh, with the 22, that included, for example, hugely populous countries like India, okay, with a relatively po uh, low poverty line. But over, the, over the subsequent decade or so, India became better off. So it was no longer in the poorest 15 by the time they did the calculation the next time round. So what happened is things like uh, India, with its relatively low poverty line, was not included in the average, but tiny little Guinea-Bissau <laughs> was included. And that had a higher poverty line than India. So what happens well, is we get something that uh, Angus Deaton, Nobel Prize winner, commented on as uh, being a situation where the whole world became poorer became, because India became richer. Pretty screwy, okay, and in terms of the numbers um, of what was going on. So that was what, a reason why when the World Bank did their latest study, they didn't change the, the, the countries for whom they were averaging the poverty lines uh, for, for robustness. Uh, and just to, to give you an idea of um, the big, big picture numbers set out on the, the, the table here, if we just look at the left-hand panel, this is the dollar ninety a day line that is, is now the, the one that they're using, you can see that the proportion poor in, in the world has fallen between 1990 and 2012 
from around 37% to just over 12%. So amazing progress uh, and, and, and in that sense, and that's terrific. Um, you might say, what about the Millennium Development Goals? Where's 2015? We don't know yet, is the answer. It takes so long to actually calculate these things for, and for data to, to come available, so we still don't know well, whether or not the MDGs have been met. We do know that China has uh, achieved its own target in MDG terms, and that's reflected in the numbers at the top. You see there for East Asia and Pacific, the numbers dropping from 61% down to 7%. Amazing progress. If you think that's great, it's true, but I'll remind you of the appalling numbers for a uh, situation that still persists in sub-Saharan Africa, starting at 56%, so up there with East Asia, but it's still 43%. So uh, there is there's still a problem in, in folk, uh, what's going on. Okay, so we've got numbers, but we've got controversy. So what happened uh, as a result of this is that in the autumn of 2015, the World Bank asked uh, Tony Atkinson uh, to answer same, a couple of questions for them. Basically, how should uh, the global poverty line be set, first? And secondly, what other sorts of information should, should they gather? And this, of course, follows directly from Tanya's talk in terms of the stiglitz Senfatusi idea of having extra indicators. They were after some as well. So Tony was the chair of this. There were 23 people who were on his advisory board, including Sen. Um, but the report the, was written by Tony alone. Uh, he did it all himself, 232 pages, rather more than Abel Smith and Townsend, but amazingly quickly done. Within 10, mu within 10 months and published in October 2016, and this was by a man who was dying of cancer. Um, terrific work. Um, you should also note that the, this is not a, a report about new estimates of global poverty, nor is it about policy. But I would argue that it's going to have a, an incredible effect about, on this in getting better estimates of trends. And one of the other things that Tony was very strong about was communicating the uncertainties associated with estimates. Often we talk about with confidence about what's going, what we know, but this is more about our uncertainty. <coughs> so on the left-hand side of this picture, I, I just repeated the two questions. And I brought up in the second column the re report that came up with 21 recommendations. Essentially, the first 10 were all about how the, d the poverty line should be defined. <laughs> the second set were about complementary indicators. So for example, uh, and I'm just going to give selective information here, um, a key thing that Tony suggested is that there should be national reports for all the countries that are included as well. This is both in terms of uh, transparency and communication. The idea of instead of having something in Washington DC, the World Bank, producing these numbers, that there was a close link with what was going on with countries. And it would also be a mutual learning experience because the, the uh, global poverty numbers would be put against the numbers that come, also come up nationally. And you could get better reconciliation. So mutual learning uh, and, and so on. Uh, and the other thing he, he suggested is that uh, the poverty line, uh, the, the PPPs rather being used, do not change again until at least 2030. You can see that that wrecks havoc, so just don't do it. Um, there are a load of complementary indicators, um, similarly uh, things that which are more information, so information about how, po how, how the uh, shortfalls <coughs> below the poverty line, how poor people are, not just whether or not they're poor, more information about the people who are poor, number of women, number of kids, uh, by age, and so on. And also, rather radically, um, a suggestion that, of moving away from absolute poverty lines, so fixed in all contexts, to one set uh, as complementary indicators that are partly sensitive to national standards of living. So it, also, it, it t tends to be a, a stylized uh, finding that for most countries, are, as they move out of extreme poverty, national poverty lines tend to rise, though not exact one-to-one, -one, with, with national standards of living. So, and that's exactly the line that we have that now in the UK, is a 60% of median income. That is a, a, a fully relative line. He was suggesting, let's have some work, something in the middle as a complementary indicator. Also, linking to the things that Tani was talking about, suggesting that we develop some measures of uh, non-monetary poverty in both the dashboard sense, 
but also putting, squishing them together in terms of a multi-dimensional poverty measure. So, 21 recommendations. What did the bank do? So, uh, very quickly, they came back and said, uh, actually, we accept 11 out of 21. Pretty good. Um, and there's, I've just given the numbers there. They said that there was some maybes, and essentially the, the maybes, the six maybes, were the ones that, well, we can't do it right now. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves, either because we don't have the money, we haven't got the partnerships, uh, or uh, is it going to take time to do it? So uh, one of the things that's particularly important, for example, is if you want to know how many people are poor in the world, you need to know uh, how many people there are in the world and in each country. So data quality concerning population is important. There's in information about errors that enter in. It's not just standard errors in the, in the pure statistical sense, but also total error. And also things about national price indices and so on. And there are four things that they rejected altogether. Um, I'll just uh, say, for, for example, Tanya mentioned some subjective measures. No way, um, they said. They also said, uh, Tony suggested that there should be an external body that would audit what the World Bank does every so often, and the World Bank said no way to that. <laughs> okay, so this is a, a, a major change. Um, thinking about it from a, you know, what would, how, how should one advise a body to get change. Tony was very Tony-ish in this uh, approach as well. It was a middle way. I mean, you might, most of you may, or many of you may hate the way the World Bank proceeds. You might say, radical change. But the trouble with proposing radical changes is that there's also a very high risk that you'll just get rejected out of hand. So what Tony's approach was very much the idea that to take this middle way, as he called it, <coughs> substantial progress in the right direction is better than radical uh, recommendations not going to get support. And I've put a quotation also up here to illustrate the fact that this idea that there are multiple views that are being incorporated um, recognises a wide range of views um, by making these judgments explicit, seeking common ground, hopes to offer a richer analysis. That was. Tony all over. It stands on work that he's done uh, in other countries. So I'm working back from the global to the UK. So he's done major reports on poverty and income distribution throughout OECD countries in the middle of the 90s. Poverty in Europe, as you see, and much, much more also uh, 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 about um, uh, poverty in Europe by himself and with, with other people. And I'm intrigued to note when I revisited Poverty in Europe, 1998, he said there, right in his final uh, paragraph, as we think about uh, developments in Europe, we should not lose sight of the objective of eliminating world poverty, which in my view has precedence. So this is back in 1998. And then working back to uh, the book that John has already referred to, this whole idea of attention to concepts, data, and monitoring infrastructures was already there. He thought, you know, this, if you want to do good policy, you need good foundations, you need good information, and so on. And then to take us back a bit further, he actually said in the book, um, this, this, this first book, the Roundtree Standard um, conveys a false impression of concreteness, and it seems to me preferable to recognize the relative nature of poverty explicitly in our definition. As it happened at that time, his relative definition of poverty was the Abel Smith and Townsend one that John has talked about. And in fact, uh, in 2014, uh, in an interview uh, with him, Tony said that, in fact, that, as John said, The Poor and the Poorest was the, the book that inspired him to study poverty. Um, and as it said there, he said to us, uh, reading it, he formed the view that economists' analysis did not address sufficiently what to do about it and set out to rectify that imbalance in his own work. So we're, you know, 50 years later, it's the same stuff, it's the same man, and the same impact. And the good news is uh, that in the last months of Tony's life, he was working on a bigger book, more ambitious, about the same topic. It is coming out uh, next year, so 50 years after his first book. So uh, you know, amazing that he was trying to do that. So, uh, you know, unfortunately the giant is dead, but his legacy and influence is going to live on for a long, long time. Thank you. Right, guys, we're, yeah, we run out of time, but, but um, 
Uh, we will take some discussion until they throw us out. Uh, for me, there were kind of like three themes running through there. One was around uh, how does poverty sit in wider measures of need or deprivation, and how do you try and integrate them into the same kind of conversation, health, education, etc. Uh, there was something about how, do, I mean, something that was very strong in a sense about how statistical information can be connected with policy debates and policy action and how, how important is it and how can it be framed in ways. And then sort of running right from the beginning, I was sort of struck in a sense by something about whenever you start talking to politicians about poverty, something to do with morality or deservingness of need starts to come into the conversation which is essentially absent when you look at the kind of statistical analysis that the guys at the end are doing. Uh, so that's kind of my sort of uh, punchlines, if you like, out of this kind of thing. But has anybody got any questions they would like to ask uh, uh, the group? I can't, um, can't see everybody at the same time. Far away. Yeah, um, in 2010, shortly after the publication, sorry, in 2010, shortly after the uh, publication of the Stiglitz report, um, uh, an old Etonian uh, became uh, prime minister of this country uh, after some long period of time. And uh, one of the uh, things I remember him pronouncing on uh, soon after his uh, election victory was uh, talking about developing uh, something along the lines of uh, a gross national measurement of gross national happiness uh, as uh, developed by Bhutan. I think the only time Bhutan was ever mentioned, I think, in the Financial Times. And I never really heard very much about it afterwards. And I wondered uh, what happened and why. I mean, what did, did it uh, have some statistics? Um, sorry. So it's, measurement problems, uh, or did the old Etonians in charge of the country just lose interest in it? Before, um, for, I think probably Tanya answers, can I just say, I've got just a note saying that the next event um, is starting in the Shakespeare the Theatre now, and so if you're attending that, uh, you probably want to go, so I have to let you go in <laughs> the next event. Um, but if you're not attending the next event, then carry on. <laughs> yeah, shall, shall I? Yeah, far away. Shall so, so, um, uh, I mentioned briefly the uh, national well-being measurement initiative that David Cameron set up, and that, that's what it turned into. So the, the, um, that the happiness tag uh, was David Cameron's own in, a, in, a, in an early speech, but it got in touch with the statisticians who said, we're not going to have a commission on happiness, national happiness, but we will have a commission on, on measuring national well-being. And subjective measures are part of that and continue to be part of that. So it, it, again, it, it does, I think, raise this question about how do we see the relationship between subjective measures of life satisfaction or, or even positive affect, as it's called, kind of how, how well people are feeling on any particular day, um, and those more objective measures of well-being. And that runs through the ONS statistics as, as much as it does through the, the original um, Sen Stiglitz Patusi Commission. Anybody else got something? Yeah, far away there. I'm curious what uh, Stephen and John mentioned the sixty percent of medium shape micro Both uh, Stephen and John mentioned sixty percent of median income. Uh, and I'm very curious that being strictly objective uh, how that compares with, which is the current model that the current government's using for minimum wage or living wage, how that compares with the Australian-New Zealand model that uses a labor council, a wage council method of having representation from labor, government, and business that annually assesses, or as the original theory of Mark Olroy suggested, semi-annually assessing the cost of living that workers want what businesses can afford and then government kind of mediating that, which possibly allows for the subjective, like Tanya mentioned, uh, variables that come into play, especially with today's modern era that uh, Lucinda discussed um, with precarious work hours and uncertainty of uh, wages. Sure. Uh, I think one important thing to keep in mind is that the, what you just referred to in terms of wages uh, and setting the level of wages is very different from thinking about the appropriate living standards in terms of poverty, poverty being a family or household level thing. And in fact, 
one of the big criticisms of the Australian and New Zealand system historically has been at assumptions of a breadwinner mo- male breadwinner model that essentially the, the idea was that wages were set enough for a man to to earn it, and that was the negotiation. It was, it was in that sort of context, which, and we we also know now today that with uh, uh, that minimum wages are particularly uh, and living wages are useful in the fight against poverty, but they're not the whole story. So poverty is more general, wider than just simply the right amount for the job. Though they may be setting those two separate lines may be motivated by overlapping similar ideas and concepts. I mean, just to add to that, um, I mean, clearly um, several of us in the room who spend a lot of our time looking at 60% of median, we know there's nothing magic about 60%. It could be 58%, it could be 50%, you know, and one has to look at the range of those. But uh, the distinction you're making is, is a very interesting one because what you describe is a kind of national conversation which decides what can we get away with. <laughs> and in a way, that is what the poor and the poorest line was. It was what had society, through the democratic process, through its government, set as the national minimum. And the problem with that is that, it, that as, as the kind of later discussions in the 1980s focused on, if government decides, and the national conversation, through whatever route, decides to become more generous, the line is more generous, more people are are caught by it. It means the national ambition for getting rid of the problem has become more ambitious, but it means our measurement of the problem becomes different. And equally in the other direction, which is actually what was really most relevant in the 1980s, um, was it becoming uh, less generous. Um, So the attempt on the measurement side is to say, well, can we step outside that and produce a measure that's independent of what policy itself is doing to to from externally measure the success of of policy, and that's a that's a very different philosophy to either what you described from Australasia, or actually the line that um, Townsend and, and Abel Smith were using, and, and Townsend then himself moved away from it. Um, so, I mean, that that debate is still with us, and I think there's something in there about the distinction between um, measuring the success of policy and how you arrive at what policy believes in all its trade-offs it can achieve. Can I just say? I mean, the, the other facet of that, which is going to be taking that to the next stage, is the other way of thinking about things is asking society what minimum <clears throat> income standards should be. Yeah? I mean, you talked about employers and unions and, and so on getting together, but there is a strand of poverty research which says that you, rather than you know an arbitrary number, you actually try and ask people what a low but acceptable living standard looks like. Yeah, and, and, you know, so there's kind of a, there's a, there's a range of uses of information, can, you know, of how society reflects itself back to, to this kind of a sense of what poverty and living standards uh, are. And, it, and it's pretty contentious as to, as to which way you should kind of move on this kind of stuff. Anyway. It's behind you. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> I've got a question for Lucinda. <laughs> about uh, Beatrice Webb, which is what happened to Beatrice Webb after 1909. You've brought, and I, I'll tell you why I asked that question, because you've brought out very clearly that on the one hand she was prescient about um, the need to cater for a range of different people with different needs, so she's prescient about beverages report in that sense. But on the other hand, you brought out very clearly that she wasn't in favour of social insurance. Now, 1909 was about when social insurance was just beginning to start with the first Unemployment Insurance Act. Would I be right, do you think, in guessing that she sort of faded away because she missed the boat on social insurance? Faded away in the sense of... 1909 was the height of her importance in, in, in... I think she would probably be a bit insulted to think that she faded away. I mean, I think she retained a lot of the... You can write a report and it not be influential because governments don't like it or it can take a long time. Um, So I think... um, But this wasn't wasn't just a one-off. I mean, she'd been thinking about, you know, the structural causes of poverty for a long time and she continued to to think about the structural causes of poverty. Uh, She and Sydney visited uh, um, uh, the Soviet Union and they thought it was great. Um, And I think it was in the... In the 30s, was it? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And so she was looking at, she was, she was continuing to look at different ways of, of organising society. I don't know whether you can say that's, I mean, just because people don't take notice of you, does that mean you're fading no, 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 a, no, away? But, uh, um, but also, I mean, the, 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 the so, uh, well, I suppose the sort of, the, the, the insurance system that was coming in in the, in, um, and that period was very different from what Beveridge was proposing as well, because it was it was much more a, um, uh, an actuarial system. So it was putting the putting the emphasis on on people kind of covering their own their own risks. Um, and uh, and she was she, what she didn't didn't like was the idea that there would be um, an, a state endorsed sort of you know we will cover your risks for you. That that was just bad for incentives. But you could say that she was also very influential in that we haven't moved moved very far at all from the notion that there should be there should be conditionality and that people things should be expected of people and that parents should be expected to send their children to school um, and that this is particularly the case if we think that those parents are a bit dodgy because they have a low income. So. I'm, I think you can still see those. Sorry, yes. Just, just perhaps to follow the question next to me and Lucinda's comment. After 1909, Beatrice and Sydney hurtle into a massive campaign. There's a night in 1910 when three successive leaders of the Labour Party, um, MacDonald, Lansbury and Attlee are uh, each addressing mass meetings in different parts of the country in support <coughs> of the minority report. Yeah, yeah. And they're Sorry, rushing should... around the country running what she calls raging tearing propaganda. <laughs> and after two years of this, Beatrice and Sydney decide that they've, that they've lost. <coughs> and they, 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 and they, they, they've hired offices just a couple of hundred yards from here on the other side of the strand. They're running this massive campaign. They decide this isn't going anywhere. Why have they lost? Actually, they've lost because 10 years earlier, Sydney, when he was working on education, has alienated the nonconformist wing of the Liberal Party. <laughs> and the nonconformists in the Liberal Party have gone the other way. Uh, they've, they've backed the uh, national insurance policy. And so it's, it's gone that way. N not that Beveridge isn't with them. Beveridge writes privately to Beatrice about the Minority Report, saying, I completely support what you're doing. Meantime, Beatrice has introduced um, Beveridge to Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill <coughs> is setting up labor exchanges, which they've recommended. Winston Churchill takes some of her key staff from the campaign, people like Ben Keeling and Arthur Colgate, and appoints them to run labor exchanges. So there's, there's something going on there. They go off, they go around the world for a year, they come back, they throw themselves into the Labour Party and they go off and they, 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 they spend the next few years running the Labour Party uh, and they, they end up, uh, Sydney <coughs> running the Labour Party during the war years, Beatrice uh, becomes active in the Fabian Society, which she'd never been before. She joins the Independent Labour Party. Within 10 years, Sydney is a cabinet minister uh, and so it goes on. And then they become completely disillusioned after the fall of the Macdonald government that's when they go into the Soviet Union, and, and then the quote that Lucinda gave at the end, uh, very close to the end, the last months of Beatrice's life, when the Beveridge Report is published, um, Beatrice is still very much in her pro-Soviet uh, period, and she does write articles <coughs> extremely critical of the, Beveridge, uh, of, of, of the Beveridge Report. But Beveridge remains a very close friend. Beveridge, right in, in, in that period, is donating royalties from one of his books to the Webb Memorial Trust. Sorry. Okay. Um, we spoke a lot about the kind of, you guys spoke a lot about the dynamics of, uh, or rather the mechanisms of poverty, be it, you know, the capabilities or the median, uh, median household income measure. Um, but I wonder if. Uh, it's, it's more effort needs to be talk, uh, done to talk about the dynamics of poverty. So, obviously, Roundtree had his life course approach, but if we were mm -hmm. to update that for these days, it would be very different. And whether in making policy and analysing policy, we need to remind policymakers and the general public that, you know, they are interrelated, but also very different from what we... Uh, what we expect. So, you know, pensioners uh, in 10 years' time and 50 years' time uh, will have a very different uh, outlook on life and uh, experience of uh, old age compared to pensioners today and 50 years ago. 
Anybody want to do persistence property? That sounds like you, Stephen. Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, say here, here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I work quite a lot on that sort of thing. Um, uh, dynamics you talked about in two particular ways. One is about taking account of, uh, as you described, life course trajectories being closely associated with different levels of income on average. Uh, things happen, uh, and and so on. So I think. You could see that that sort of thing in terms of the richer profile, for example, that Tony Atkinson was recommending to the World Bank in terms of the poverty profiles to be produced in the complementary indicators would be a reflection of that rather than, you know, the headline is not necessarily so useful. Is it children that Lucinda was talking about with the webs and so on and emphasizing and also Abel Smith and Townsend? The, net, the other thing is about yeah, movement in and out of low income and, or poverty, and, and that, that is a... You know, I think it's important, but it's also a big ask. Uh, we're managing it in the UK with a lot of resources and at, you know, in the European Union. Imagine doing that for uh, the World Bank uh, and all the countries around the world. Uh, very difficult. And in fact, so what they're doing in the World Bank context is exploring uh, statistical models to try and get at the same information so-called synthetic panels, pseudo-panels. So there is interest. The, the, the big thing is how, much, how, how useful is the information, given the, with the huge cost, extra cost it would involve to have longitudinal surveys. So very important. Okay, um, so I've been a student in social policy for about six months now. Um, and it kind of strikes me that there is a massive preoccupation in social policy and academia with measurement rather than like affecting things and like so the measurement of the success of a lot of these LSE giants has been how they have done some research that has redefined how we measure things rather than measuring success as we reduce poverty and I can't uh, a struggle to be sat in this room in the LSE to come here and find that the people here are talking about, continuously talking about how do we measure it, how do we measure it, and not what do we do. I think that's really kind of pertinent. Yeah, I think that uh, how evidence is used in campaigning and changing policymakers' views. We didn't really talk enough about how the Millennium Development Goals have changed policy in, in, in developing countries and have been used as a kind of lever to, to produce change. I, I don't know if you, which of you guys do you want to... Well, can, I, can I come in defence of my giants? Um, and I, I did touch on this. Um, I think Brian Abel Smith and Peter Townsend, I didn't know Brian Abel Smith very well, I knew Peter Townsend a little. I think you can see their whole careers from the 1950s about research for the purposes of changing the country. Um, and very explicitly, the publication of The Poor and the Poorest, it was based on research they had carried out about measurement, but they were deeply involved in campaigns to publicly rediscover poverty. It wasn't about something that would sit on the shelf and then we'd look at it 50 years later and say, oh, that's, so that's how it was in, in 1960. Um, they were part of the discussions, they were part of the group that led to the foundation of the Child Poverty Action Group. Um, you can see their deliberate use of the publication timing of the poor and the poorest in order to get press publicity, to talk to television people to get publicity, and then furious arguments between them and the Labour government of the time as to whether they were exposing the failures of government, but actually then changes in government policy, increases in family allowances, and then a whole series of, of changes, which I, I really, you know, I said this, and I really think it's true, that if you look at the, the explicit fall in child poverty measured in relative terms um, under the, uh, the last Labour government between 1997 and, and 2010, um, I think you can draw a direct line from their work to the action that Gordon Brown in particular took. I mean, Paul, Paul will be part of this and say whether this is true or not. Um, <laughs> but that concrete fall in poverty with the effects on people's future lives, I think you can take back to the stream of work that 
uh, poor, the poor and the poorest crystallized. Its influence was still going on. And very much that would have been what Peter Townsend in particular, but I think also Brian Abel Smith, would have seen as being what they were, what they were in it for. But Paul, you were, you were, you were heavily involved. You know, to what extent can you trace back that, that measurement effort to the commitment that, the, that that government uh, made? I, mean, I don't know. So, so what sort of struck me in the sense was, was that how child poverty was seen as materially more important as a policy goal, yeah? And that does connect right back, and it actually goes all the way back to sort of Roundtree and stuff like that, and, 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 and uh, Beatrice Webb. But um, it, it, I, I, I genuinely don't know where the Labour government's commitment to uh, eliminate child poverty came from. Somebody once told me, because it was Tony Atkinson sat at a dinner next to Tony Blair, Tony Blair said, what should we do? And he said, well, you should eliminate child poverty. Um, <laughs> but, but, OK, I'm, I'm sort of digressing. But I, I feel is that uh, I think there's something really interesting about under what circumstances does evidence and measurement actually lead to policy change? What, is, what, what, necess, what needs to be happening around it? Because, you know, we measure things all the time. What are the kind of conditions which turn the people, the work that people are doing in these kind of researches into action? And, you know, I think the Millennium Development Goals were an explicit attempt to try and gate, to generate levers to produce government action. They were, they were taken in order to say that GDP per capita doesn't capture it as a, as a measure, as a statistical measure. What we need is things which we can try and hold governments to account for and therefore force them or to engage with it and produce change. And so there is, there's a space between measurement and building coalitions for action within governments and within, you know, across transnational bodies, which happen periodically but are not sustained, would be my sense. But I don't know what the other guys say. Um, my question is more regarding sort of the impact of the government on the economy. I know. I think um, quite a lot of our research, I mean, we've, we've been focusing particularly on, on poverty and um, a number of aspects of that do, are very closely involved with measurement, but I don't know that that would be a fair characterisation of the work of the social policy department as a whole, let alone the wider LSE. Um, so the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion, for example, has got a new programme called Social Policies and Distributional Outcomes in a Changing Britain. And a large element of that is precisely looking at what has happened in terms of policies across a wide range of areas, taxes and benefits, health, education, <coughs> physical security, criminal justice, a whole range of different areas, housing, <coughs> excuse me, to chart what have those various different policy interventions achieved in way of improving poverty, inequality, um, and other forms of, of disadvantage. So it's necessarily retrospective, it's necessarily looking at what has happened, um, but the, I, the idea of monitoring and evaluating what the combined effect of those policies has been puts us in a position to inform debates about what should be done in the future. So and that's just one example, but the, there's a whole range of different types of research that are done that we haven't particularly talked about today that, that do, I think, speak more directly to your areas of concern. Yeah. Ellis' point's a really good one. i just also talk about my giant, uh, for which we had a whole event last Friday uh, about his, uh, around his, his book, last book before this one, which was called Inequality, What Can Be Done? Okay, and there were 15 proposals that Tony Atkinson put up, uh, which we spent the day discussing about what can, what can go on. Uh, we had an evening session about the practical politics of these sort of things. So I think you raise a, a really good uh, general issue, but I would say, perhaps defensively, that you also, you also, in terms of knowing whether or not there's success or failure, you do need to know information base. And as Paul said, you need tar targets can be very useful. I mean, the eradication of child poverty may have been a foolish political promise, but boy, it was still a light, you know, that was 
provide the torch that was keeping many people going. Well, I'm just running, just, just taking a little bit further. I mean, since there's the kind of the relationship with governments and official bodies and sitting on commissions or uh, specific policy proposals, which we've sort of touched on. But there's also, if you like, the media and campaigning side, which I think, you know, I take the point with um, Townsend and stuff that they did that. But it's not all, it certainly wasn't Tony Atkinson's kind of style, yeah? But it's, it's whether, it, it's a, the relevance, if you like, of policy, of, of academic researchers to be engaging in those kind of campaigns and stuff, you know? Making TV programs, blogs, and all of this kind of stuff, it's a lot more of it happening now than there used to be, I think is the kind of sense, yeah? And I would say that that kind of space is getting, is getting bigger relative to some of these kind of guys where in you know, a different media age, if you like. Okay, anyway. We should, we should probably wrap up, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Last word to George. So my recollection uh, of Brian Abel Smith was that he was very close to Barbara Castle. And before SPADs were invented, he spent an enormous amount of effort uh, shaping labor policy. But I wanted to ask a question about subjective measures of well-being, etc. Does uh, Runciman's concept of relative deprivation, and particularly fraternalistic relative deprivation, feature in these debates? Short answer, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pity. Yeah. But it's, I think it's important, yeah. Clearly, it's clearly relevant. Right, I think we'd better go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.